This is the Carnival Imagination, a luxury cruise liner worth hundreds of millions of dollars, which just 10 short months ago was touring passengers in first-class comfort to exotic places around the world. This ship is sailing ahead to its last port of call, where it's been sold for scrap along with dozens of other ships that have become the latest victims of the global pandemic. The Shittagong Shipbreaking Yard in Bangladesh is the largest ship dismantling yard in the world, and in the previous few months, even its large shorelines have become filled with pleasure crews and industrial cargo ships. All of these could have sailed the oceans for many more decades. These are all very troubling signs for the unsung heroes of our modern global economy, the Merchant Marine Fleet. Every year, trillions of dollars worth of cargo is transported on ships, and losing this fleet could turn into a huge barrier to global trade. But what's really going on here? Why would profit-motivated corporations scuttle billions of dollars worth of productive assets? Sure, times are tough. We know tourism and trade have declined, but this doesn't look like a very reasonable response, right? We don't burn down our house if a video gets less than 10,000 likes, so why would companies in such a competitive industry do something equally as self-destructive? Well, it always has to do with economics. And to understand this bizarre behavior, we need to understand a few key areas. What are the economics behind the merchant marine fleet? How do these factors make it financially viable to dismantle ships? What does this mean for the future of international trade? And what does all this have to do with Chinese bridge building? Now, the majority of ships have a service life of around 40 years. At the end of the day, they are a depreciating asset, just like a car, truck, or piece of industrial equipment. At a certain point, they cost more to maintain than they bring in from profit. Additionally, older ships are naturally less efficient. They burn more fuel and require larger crews. With the average crew member costing around $75,000 per year, this is a major consideration. The whole industry runs on very thin margins, and the difference between a crew of 10 and a crew of 30 could be the difference between a profitable journey or one that ends up costing money. The number game extends to other areas as well. An increasingly common trend among shipping companies is something called slow steaming. Slow steaming is sailing the ships slower than they are capable of in order to save on fuel costs. The trade-off is that items get delivered days later than they would have otherwise, but shipping companies have determined that a net reduction in speed offsets the cost of requiring slightly slower global supply chains. This also helps major shipping companies in their push to operate larger and larger vessels. A large industry standard vessel is usually around 900 feet long, which is a popular size because it's the longest ship that can make it through the Panama Canal. In fact, they even have a class designation. These ships are commonly known as Panamas. How do you suppose they came up with that one? Now, these kinds of ships can usually carry around 100,000 tons of cargo or raw materials, which sounds like a lot of cargo, but let's compare that to the latest and largest ships roaming the ocean. The Vail Axe class of bulk carriers are only 40% longer than these Panama crossers at 1180 feet in length. These ships have a capacity of 380,000 tons, meaning they have four times the cargo of their smaller Panama crossing cousins. This is thanks to the square cube law. Basically, shipping companies only care about how much cargo they can fit in their ships. The cargo is what they make money on. The ships themselves are basically containers to be filled. Now, if you make a container twice as long, twice as thick, and twice as high, you might think, great, I can fit twice as much stuff in it. But in reality, you can fit eight times as much stuff in it, while only using four times as much material. This is one of the huge benefits of ocean shipping over all other forms of transport. Ships can get big. This obsession over numbers and scale is what makes the merchant navy the pack mule of globalization. Nations that are landlocked are always at a huge disadvantage. The reason is that it cuts them off from international trade via ocean shipping. You could say, there are plenty of other ways to move stuff around. Trains, planes, trucks, grub hub, and none of these alternatives require an ocean or port infrastructure. And that's perfectly fair, but none of these alternatives are nearly as affordable as using a ship. 
Trains are the efficiency runners up because their steel on steel locomotion offers little friction. So once they get going, they keep on going, but these still lose out to cargo ships and require a lot more infrastructure to make them worthwhile. This also becomes much more difficult to make happen if the train line needs to span across multiple nations that may or may not even be benefiting from the trade. The benefits of shipping show some incredible results that you may not expect. If you wanted to get just one standard 40-foot shipping container from the United Kingdom to Australia, you would pay a retail shipping rate of 2200 British pounds or 3057 US dollars. This sounds expensive, but the containers are large. On the other hand, if you wanted to ship that same container from the United Kingdom to Switzerland, it would cost 3100 British pounds or 4307 US dollars. This is despite Switzerland being 20 times closer. A ship can sail straight from the UK to Sydney or work across popular shipping routes. The container destined for Switzerland either would fly or be transported on the back of a truck. These are retail rates and the major exporters would have wholesale deals in place with the shipping companies. But the margins are likely to be wider in these wholesale deals rather than this one example of a single shipping container. Now this has implications beyond moving containers. It can determine the economy of nations. If a landlocked country wanted to compete on price for manufactured goods, it would not only need to produce items cheaper than their competitors, but they would also need to produce items cheaper than their competitors after the expenses of trucking components in and the finished products are trucked out. What this means is that low-cost manufacturing is just not really an option for these countries, which is a major problem because low-cost manufacturing has been the driver of nations to make the leap from underdeveloped to developed, bringing millions of their residents out of absolute poverty across the world in recent decades. For nations like Switzerland, it doesn't really matter. Because of their economy is based around advanced financial services, which do not need to be loaded into shipping containers. And what few products they do manufacture are so valuable that shipping costs are usually irrelevant. But for a country like Mongolia, this is just an unfortunate reality. However, this status quo has been majorly challenged by the fallout of the coronavirus. International trade has fallen drastically as nations move to close borders and consumer demand dries up across the world. There have also been major hits to companies that operate a fleet of both cargo and passenger ships because very few are getting on a cruise ship these days. The shrinking of demand has meant that fewer containers are being moved, which requires a fleet of fewer and smaller ships to move them. You have to remember that smaller ships are far from the best deal for shipping companies. One bonus has been that oil costs during this period have also been extraordinarily low. This has been a major win for shipping companies in two ways. For starters, it's offset the portion of the costs of having to run smaller, less efficient ships with smaller cargo loads, but has also provided a very odd source of revenue. You might remember that earlier this year, oil prices went to the negatives. This was a weird phenomenon, but the cause is basically that the world had too much oil and nowhere to keep it before a due date determined by derivatives that drive the oil market. Or even more basically, the world needed somewhere to keep its oil and oil tankers are great at that. The smart speculators ordered space on these tankers, got paid to take on oil, sailed the ships around in circles for a month, and then sold the oil back to the market that paid them to have it in the first place. This was a very profitable, although risky, strategy for the commodity speculator, but it was a fantastic risk-free payday for the shipping companies. They got paid to effectively do what they were doing anyway with their ships, which was pretty much nothing. However, this little win was great, but it was short-lived. Oil prices stabilized at more reasonable levels, but the demand for ships didn't do the same. This has led to these companies to start making some tough decisions. During times of economic uncertainty, responsible governments will roll out fiscal stimulus that aims to fill the shortfall in consumer spending with government spending. The hope of these projects is that they can maintain employment incomes and quality of life during times of challenge. These stimulus bills can also achieve some nice healthy side effects. For example, in the USA, the stimulus was used to prop up corporations that might be useful to them once the economy recovers. 
Australia used its fiscal spending to prop up a housing market so that it wouldn't end badly, and there are similar stories for most developed countries around the world. However, along with the headlines of trillions of dollar bailouts and quantitative easing concerns, people have overlooked that China is doing something remarkably similar, although with a bit more forward planning. The Chinese government is spending hundreds of billions of dollars on stimulus, the same as everybody else, but that stimulus is coming in the form of infrastructure spending. As a side note, this is a real smart move. Infrastructure stimulus is excellent. It employs people like laborers, engineers, tradesmen in the short term. It gets money out to local suppliers, all while having the benefit of producing a bridge, a railroad, a shipping port, which continue to provide industrial capacity into the future. Despite being a clever piece of policy, spending on all these lovely infrastructure projects requires a lot of materials, specifically iron. The demand from China to facilitate these infrastructure developments has been so strong that it's increased the price of iron ore by over 300% from where it was just five years ago. This upswing in iron ore prices has also been accelerated by reduced supply from nations like Australia, which has been battling with state-to-state -state lockdowns. That means a lot of their miners can't get to work. Now this is all well and good, and commodity prices go up, but what does this have to do with ships? Well, ships are made of steel, and the money that the shipping companies receive for scrapping their ships is at the highest point it's been in almost a decade. So shipping companies have a choice. Stay the course and continue to pay millions of dollars a year in crew costs, insurance, docking fees, maintenance, and fuel for ships that may or may not go back to work in the full capacity within the next few years, or scrap them for a payday right now. Unfortunately, for all the reasons listed above, the market for secondhand ships is weaker than the market for scrap metal, so it's looking like a pretty favorable option and one that more and more companies will need to exercise. What they're doing is reducing their fleet, starting with the oldest ships, first in the hopes that it will lower their overheads while giving them an injection of cash that they can use to ride out the global pandemic, or maybe even be used to invest in the next generation of more efficient ships. It's obviously a gamble. If the world went back to normal tomorrow, it would have been a terrible move to sell a perfectly operational ship for the price of its scrap metal, but unfortunately for a lot of companies, it's becoming a decision that's getting made for them. With less ships around to carry the weight, what does it mean for the future of global trade? A smaller merchant marine fleet may very well be an accelerating factor in the push for nations to become more and more self-sufficient. If 2020 has shown anything, it's that if things go wrong, it's every man for themselves, for better or for worse. Now the trade-off to this self-sufficiency will be that global trade allows countries to leverage their comparative advantage. That advantage could be oil production, the UAE luxury cars from Germany, or low-cost manufacturing in China. If any of these countries were forced to perform in the industries of their peers, they would either do a bad job of it or produce goods that are prohibitively expensive. Global trade has allowed nations to focus on what they're good at at the expense of being a little less self-sufficient. Over time, the shift from self-sufficiency to cooperation has always been a positive one. Imagine if you had to produce everything you ever needed by yourself. But will the process be slowed or even reversed by these factors? Well, probably. It looks like that's the way the big money is betting, but it's hard to tell for now. If nothing else, a dismantling of ships is a great case study into how nothing in the global economy happens in isolation. Lost demand in the United States means fewer cargo containers from Japan, which is making Greek ships useless outside of providing raw materials to China for infrastructure projects that are trying to prop up the same demand shortfall that caused this whole issue in the first place.